Well, hey, just let, let's jump into the scripture uh, real quick as we start Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the woman, women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said, said come and see the place where he lay. He is risen. He is risen indeed. There you go. Come on, we can do better than that. He is risen. Amen. Well, today we join with the church around the world in declaring that Jesus is risen, that he is alive, and that he is active in the world even now. Throughout uh, the Lenten season here at Newbridge, we have spent our time reflecting on the hard but necessary lessons that we learn from the seasons of life in the desert. But today, well, today we celebrate life. Which, that which emerges from the desert. Uh, we celebrate uh, life that emerges, and it's something more beautiful than we can ever possibly imagine. Today, we celebrate the resurrection uh, uh, life of Jesus, not just in the life to come for us, but in the life that we are living even today, in this moment. Aren't you thrilled that we're out of the desert? Some of you are like, that was too long in the desert, Pastor Tim. <laughs> we got to get out of the desert. Well, today we are out of the desert. Well, this past Friday during our Good Friday service, we spent our time reflecting on what I said was the ultimate desert for Jesus that he faced as he went to the cross. And today we celebrate his history-altering emergence from that desert. We celebrate his resurrection from death to life. And friends, I want to tell you today that the resurrection changes everything. The resurrection changes everything. It changed everything for the disciples back on that first uh, resurrection Sunday, and it changes everything for you and me today. Because without the resurrection, we have no hope. But thank God today, because we do have hope, because Jesus defeated death Now, last uh, week for Palm Sunday, we looked at the fact that Jesus, as he entered Jerusalem for the last time before his death, had established once and for all that he was and is the king. And just in case you missed it last week, let me summarize it for you real quick. He is the king of kings. He is the sovereign ruler over all. He is the Messiah. He is the savior. That is who he is. And so today on this Resurrection Sunday, I want to spend time, our time looking not just at who Jesus is, but what he does. So here's a guiding statement for my message today. God does not abandon anyone who others might think are hopeless and dead. Let me say that again and let that sink in. God does not abandon anyone who others might think are hopeless and and dead. And what Jesus does and continues to do is to bring life out of death. You see, at the very core of the gospel message is that the triune God has the power to make dead things come back to life. And that's good news. That is good news. On Friday, the debt for sin and death was paid, and the resurrection sealed the deal. It's the exclamation point to Jesus' statement on the cross. It is finished. It's as if Jesus declared to the whole world that first Easter Sunday, just so you all know I meant what I said, I'm going to do what no person has ever done before or since then. I'm going to come back to life and give you everything you need for life and godliness. I'm going to give you access to the same power that raised me from the dead. The same spirit that raised me from the dead will raise you too if you will welcome him into your life. And even before his own resurrection, he had a habit of bringing dead people back to life, right? 
Uh, he did that for a synagogue leader, uh, his, his daughter, uh, the synagogue leader whose name was Jairus. Uh, Jesus receives word that she has died, and he shows up. He does a couple mir- a miracle, an amazing miracle on the way. He shows up on the scene, and he raises her back to life. He did a similar thing in a beautiful story recorded in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 7 where he raises back to life a widow's son in in a remote, uh, out-of-town, out-of-the-way town called Nain where in the midst of a funeral procession, Jesus displays a deep care for this woman in her grief and in her loss and brings her son back to life. And actually, in doing so, brings, restores her, restores her, her, her means of, of, of security and financial security. And maybe you are here today and you've never heard of those two resurrections, but you might have heard perhaps of, of the most well-known resurrection other than Jesus' own resurrection, where Jesus in John chapter 11 raises his friend Lazarus back to life after being in the grave for a few days. Now, there are a few things that these stories all have in common. common. The, The primary thing is that there was death. But also in each narrative, uh, the, the, the stories describe people who, who scoffed at the idea that Jesus would or could do anything about death. They thought uh, and expressed uh, about the people that they loved or the friends that were dead uh, that it was, it was hopeless, it was impossible, but Jesus showed them his power. But not just his power, but his love and his grace, and he brought life out of death and raised their still bodies back to life. But friends, it's important for us to understand this morning that Jesus offers more than just physical resurrection. He promises to speak life, to breathe life, to cause life to emerge from the ashes of our lives today. And this is the work that he is bringing into every part of creation. You know, one of the things I I love about Easter, especially here in the Northeast, uh, as we've moved back into spring, kind of, have we? I don't know. We had spring a couple weeks ago, and and then we roared back into winter. But I know Easter is early early this year. But one of the things I love is that all around us, uh, things are literally springing back to life. With spring comes the the birds returning to us, singing their life-giving songs. I had my office window open this morning as I got here at 7 a.m. And all was quiet, and the birds were singing their songs of life. Flowers are springing up all around, even if it does feel a bit, bit cold. You know, you, when, when you see those perennials come up out, to the, out of the ground and it's still cold outside, you kind of want to say, go, go back down, wait a little bit longer, you might not make it. Here's a picture I took yesterday of some crocuses uh, springing up in the front of my house. Now, my wife Becky and I, we didn't plant these. They've probably been there for years, but every spring they emerge with a beauty and life that only God can create. All winter long, they lay there dormant, seemingly lifeless, lifeless, and then God does his thing and brings about life. And so that leads me to a truth that I, I desperately want you all to understand today. And that is that not only is nature nature around us springing back to life, but because of the resurrection of Jesus, God's kingdom continues to break into this world and the dead are coming back to life. Now today I thought I would take a little bit of a different approach to my Easter message Uh, maybe than I have in the past. We're going to look at a few key passages of Scripture that give us a vision for what God has done for what he is doing now and what he will do in the future. And so I want to start out with this prophetic word that, the, uh, that Isaiah the prophet gives us about Jesus the Messiah and his promises to his, his people. Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. 
See, God, through the prophet Isaiah, is inviting all of us to have faith in what we might not be able to perceive. Even if we find ourselves, some of you, you you know, I I said, well, aren't you glad we're out of the desert? Well, I know the reality is some of you still are in the desert. Just because it's Easter Sunday doesn't mean that you are not in depression or doesn't mean that you're not struggling with something in your life. Some of you are in the desert. And I need you to know that God promises to pour out a stream of living water, of life into you that you, you never saw coming. You might not be able to perceive it now. And of course, this promise in in the book of Isaiah would be fulfilled in Jesus. And make no mistake, he is still making a way in the desert. He's making a way in the wilderness. He's still doing a new thing. And in each of us, just like the crocuses in my front yard, there is the potential for God to do his amazing work of recreating in us life where there was once death. The death and resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, really is fulfilled in, this prophecy is fulfilled in that. The new thing that God inspired uh, the prophet Isaiah to write 500 years before Jesus came to earth became a reality on that first Easter Sunday. And friends, I need you to know, and I might sound like a broken record today, but I need you to know that it's still happening. He's still doing a new thing. He's still bringing life to things and to people that are dead. His resurrection and restoration are hallmarks of the kingdom of God, which is still unfolding and advancing in our world today. He's still restoring all things to himself. N.T. Wright, who is one of the most prominent, maybe the most prominent New Testament scholars of our day and theologians of our day, has spoken and written a lot about this idea in Scripture that God is making all things new. And the truth of that reality hinges on what we celebrate today. It hinges on the resurrection of Christ one of the key scriptures that Wright and others use to illustrate this and to, uh, and to talk about this is it comes out of the book of Revelation where the resurrected Christ says, I am making everything new. Amen. Revelation 21.5, he who was seated on the throne, that is the resurrected Christ, said, I am making everything new. And what Wright posits is that this declaration of making all things new does not involve, now hear me now, discarding or replacing the world that is already here or even our lives. No, what he suggests, and and I I believe this, is, is that it's a transformation of our world and our lives. It's a restoring of what already is. Does that make sense? Are you tracking with me? We're currently doing a renovation in our house. It's the last kind of inside thing that we're doing. It was built in 1962. And essentially, it's our last effort to move from the 1960s to the 2020s. But our house hasn't changed. You following me? Our house hasn't changed, but we have been in the process of making all things new. And so what we often find, especially when it comes to attempts at interpreting the book of Revelation and the end times in particular, the predominant way of thinking is that everything is going to disappear and that God is going to start fresh. But in Wright's view, and I tend to agree, that the new heaven and the new earth are about God's kingdom fully realized here on earth. Heaven and earth he he says, are not seen as two separate locations, but rather as overlapping spheres. Take a look at what Wright says in his book, Surprised by Hope. He says, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. That, after all, he says, is what the Lord's prayer is about, right? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Where? On earth as it is, that's right, in heaven. Yes. Heaven is invading earth. God is recreating all things. He's restoring all things. 
And God's plan is not to abandon this world, but to renew it and to raise it back to life. Have you caught a theme today? Uh, you know, I, I, every, every Easter, well, I mean, every Sunday, I'm like, okay, Jesus, what do you, what do you want me to say today? And, and this day, I just got a very clear word. Tell them what I'm doing. Tell them about the life that I give. Tell them that I can restore I can restore the most dead thing in the world and bring it back to life. And you know, the same, uh, this recreation of the world is also true in our lives, that the redemption that was secured by Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his subsequent, subsequent resurrection is bringing life, springing forth out of the former dead realities of our lives. He uses the same frame and rebuilds and bring newness and life from within to our lives. The Apostle Paul writes, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. Eternal life, yes, not just, but, not, but not just eternal life, but life right now, available to all who would receive it today. And those words I find particularly interesting by the Apostle Paul, who, if you know his story, maybe you don't, he was all but dead. In fact, he would write in Ephesians to to the Ephesian church, you were dead in your transgressions, you were dead in your sins, and his testimony, his life was that. Until the resurrected Jesus stopped him in his tracks and showed him that life was possible in and through him. Through him. In, in, here's a man who his sole focus was to bring death, not life. That was the Apostle Paul's, well, before he was the Apostle Paul's name was Saul. That was his sole purpose. He arranged and set out to execute Christians wherever he could find them. And on one of those missions, Jesus stopped him in his tracks. And from, uh, and, and, and I guess, I don't know if that's the right scripture reference in my notes. But, okay, Jesus stops him in his tracks and, and, and shows him that he is actually bringing death. And in his testimony in Acts 26, when he's on trial, he says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. And that is what he was doing on his way to Damascus when Jesus grabbed a hold of his life. And God, in his infinite love and grace, showed Paul in a dramatic way that he, Jesus, was the resurrection in the life, just like he said he was. And Paul, who was once dead in his sin, became alive in Christ. And as you read through Paul's testimony in Acts chapter 9 and his conversion, Jesus says about Paul that he will make him a chosen instrument to proclaim his name. In Acts 26, Paul says, Jesus made me a witness, to the, a witness to those that rejected the life of Jesus. Now, why does, this any, does any of this matter? Why does it matter? Maybe you're here today because someone invited you to church and you said yes to be nice, but you're not sure that any of this is true. Or maybe you've been going through life and you feel like there is no hope. Or maybe you just question it all. Maybe you think that there's no need for a savior because you think your life is just fine as it is. But is it really? 
Now, let me get real personal for a moment. Those of you that have your eyes on me this morning are looking at a formerly dead man who has had the resurrected life of Jesus poured onto me. I have experienced firsthand the resurrection power of new life being formed in me. And my testimony might not be as dramatic as the Apostle Paul's, but it was no less miraculous. And I don't have the time to tell you my whole life story or where I come from. It comes out in bits and pieces in my sermons. But if you understood, friends, where I came from, and how much of a miracle my life is. I was dead. And Jesus, in his love and grace, plucked me from death's grip and did a new thing. He brought about new life, and he's still doing it. I am in no way perfect. I am a work in progress. I am walking that road of sanctification. I stumble and fall from time to time, but Jesus is with me wherever I go. And he's speaking life into me. My life is a living, breathing testimony of God's life-giving power. You know, I, I didn't have this in my notes, but one of my, my colleagues is here today from the PAUSE ministry team that I've mentioned many times before. And when we are going through those workshops, when we are hearing people's deepest trauma and deepest pain, we see God bring life out of the ashes, don't we, Lisa? Lisa? And it's a miracle to behold. It's a, a miracle to witness that God does an amazing thing, even with people who have been abused, even with people who have, have, have had curses spoken over them their entire lives, even people who have been taken advantage of, even people who have substance abuse problems and, and addiction problems, even people who have family trauma. God takes those lives and makes beautiful things out of the ashes. And so this matters today because whether or not you realize that we are surrounded by death. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer today. That's probably not a, a proper term anymore. I probably shouldn't say Debbie Downer. Why is she always down? I don't want to be a... I'm trying to, I'm trying to be sensitive here. But aren't we... When you read the headlines, and, and God help me if I read the news, it's just depressing, Right? We hear and read about wars and, and famine and we hear about heartache and trial in our own country and, and there's, there's death all around us. And apart from Christ and his resurrection, we can't get past that. There's no solution that we can come up with to, to bring la uh, life from death. And so I want to restate my original statement at the beginning. God does not abandon anyone who others might think are hopeless and dead. And so what I want to ask you this morning is, is there something in your soul that feels like death? Is there something in your lives that is, is it just feels like it keeps on nagging at you? Is there something in your soul that feels like death? Because let me tell you something, Jesus wants to speak life into that. He wants to bring life to you. And the only thing that you have to do is to receive his life, to say yes to him, to come to him. And, 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 it, and it's, a, it's like a beautiful exchange. There's a song that we used to do years ago called Beautiful Exchange, and it described the exchange that happened at the cross, that we are invited, we are welcome to bring all of our stuff. Anybody have stuff in here? I have a ton of stuff. I have a ton of stuff. And thank God in his grace and in his mercy and love, he invited me into a process to bring that stuff to him and let him redeem it, let him restore it, let it bring life out of the ashes. Some of you come from families of origin that have, if you were to describe it, have ruined you. That's my, that's my story. And yet God in his grace wants to take 
all of the trauma and all of the pain and all of that stuff, and he wants to turn it into something beautiful. When you, when you think that nothing could possibly come out of this, nothing beautiful can emerge from this, God, when you allow him to do his work in your life, brings beauty from ashes. And so, do you feel abandoned? Do you feel that there is hopelessness and death. I believe today that God is inviting you in to his recreation, his recreating life-giving story. He wants you to be a part of that. Paul says, uh, the apostle Paul says to the Philippians in chapter three, I wanna know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow, he doesn't even know exactly how it works. None of us do. Attaining to the resurrection from the dead. That is the message of Easter. That's the message of the gospel, that God wants to take those things and make them new. And so I want to invite you this morning if there's something that you need prayer for, if there's something in your soul that is nagging at you, I believe that God wants to impart upon you today his life-giving power. We have no special power. I have no special power. But Jesus does. And what he does in and through our lives by his power is, some, is nothing short of a miracle. It is a miracle. It is the miraculous hope of the resurrection. Jesus is life. Amen?